I'm just a butler. Barbara Streisand lives next door. Bert Reynolds lives on the other side. Frank Sinatra lives down the street. Elvis, Michael Jackson, and there's a billion dollars worth of art in the house. And nobody knows that they've got a bank robber in the home. So how does that work out? It's brilliant. So you were you were born in Detroit, Michigan. And no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my god so you were born in liverpool yeah i was born in liverpool in the city center when is this 1957 okay all right yeah um, what, what and what were your you know what were your parents uh what did they do your mom well, my father he was in the merchant navy and my mother was, you know, is a, like an American. They, you know, she stayed at home and raised the kids. So, but where we lived, Matt, it was a very tough area, um, Scotland Road. It was notorious for um, street fights and gangs in the day and very tough people. So that environment that we grew up in was very tough. And we had no choice as, you know, the, we just come out the war and, you know, the late 60s and that, and it was still, we had them, that feeling there. So we had no choice, really. And as kids, you know, there was not much for us. So we just, um, I got up one morning. My father was absent. He was in the Merchant Navy sending the money home to my mother. And um, I just got up one morning and went on the streets about 4 o'clock in the morning. Okay. And, and I just decided to go and help the milkman to deliver the milk to bring some money into the home. And um, I helped him and I seen the bag that he had. And the next week I, I worked with him. And then the following week he asked me to collect the money. So I got there a few hours before. And then what I did, I collected the whole lot of it, the whole bag before anybody, and because they, they knew me. And I right. think it was approximately 96 pounds or something like that. And then... That was in 19, or oh, that was 1964. And then what happened is I took that money and I, I buried it in a cemetery. But <laughs> um, yeah. He knew you took it though. They called the police? Yeah, they got the police and they came around and the police got me and said, Why isn't he in school? And I was unruly. I was, you know, I just wouldn't do as me told. So what I did is um, I wouldn't tell them. And then that was the first, you know, I just, the police said, Where's the money? And I wouldn't tell them. <laughs> And then what we did was we just kept it and we just, and then I formed a gang then. So then in them days, we had, um, we had the bread company. We had um, the lemonade company. Then we had the co-op. So me, the gang, um, David Brooks, Ronnie Gibbons, John Lally and Franny Jones. We all got together and um, one Friday night, we all got together and we decided that we would like say like Vons or Ralphs where they take all the money for the weekend. We decided that we would go in there, distract the cashier, go to the register and just get the bag and empty it. And at the time we we were all eight and nine years of age. So this is the gang that I formed and um, we all left and then we all bought, um, at the time, I went and bought five cigars. Wait a minute. So you, you robbed the place. Yes. And, and it worked. Like the, the, crew, the crew of eight, nine-year-olds went into a place and, and just strong. Did you, you just strong-armed them? Or? Well, no. What we did, we, you know, we distracted the cashier. She went down the, the, the aisle to get the tin of beans with Franny. And I jumped over and I emptied the register. And then okay. well, it was, you know, it was quite a bit of money. It was 136 pounds, actually. It was like being a millionaire when you're eight years of age. Right. And then we ran out and then we buried it all in the cemetery with with the rest of the stash. And then what we did was that we, um, I went and bought five cigars. And the guy said in the liquor store, who's the cigars for? I said, oh, they're for my father. It's his birthday. And then we got a taxi. We're all sitting in the... Um, in the taxi smoking cigars at eight and nine years of age. And then we go over to a little place over by Liverpool. It's called New Brighton on the ferry. And we come back and then we get caught. John and Ronnie got taken into custody because they were 
I think they were nine and a half. They so, so they got sentenced to probation, and then it was only a, a matter of time before me and Franny would would be nine years of age that they would take us into custody. Yeah. What happened to you guys? Well, what happened was about a few months later, Franny was in a house, and he was he was staking this house out. In them days, they had what you call gas meters, where they had the money in the homes. So Franny introduced me to it. And Franny went into a house and the back door was open and he went in and he got a hammer and a screwdriver and he smashed the the gas meter open and he took all the money. I was not with him at the time, but they thought I was with him. So then what they did is that they took us into care. So for the previous things that we did, the co-op and the milkman, they said, oh, we'll take them into care anyway. Right. And they took us into care. And then what they, they did in them days in Liverpool and, and um, the British government, they'd, they'd formed these schools, Matthew, they're called approved schools. And they gave us three years. We got okay. three years. Yeah, me and Franny got three years. They sent us to an, um, an assessment centre. And then in that assessment centre, we were sent to what you call an approved school in 1968, 69, approximately 68, 69. And we were sentenced to three years each. And um, they put Franny in a, a closed, it was called Red Bank. It was um, a secure unit for the, for, you know, kids with psychosis and all that. And then they put me in this home. And then eventually I did about two and a half years and um, total abuse. Right. Under the umbrella of the um, constantly being abused by the... Um, the men that were running the home, the teachers, and the um, the headmasters. A um, lot of rape going on at the time. A lot of bullying. Um, kids beating the hell out of each other. And um, eventually I was released. And I, was, um, I only had one day of freedom. I came home. I felt that the house was empty. My father wasn't there. My mother wasn't there. And um, I actually went into a store and um, I had a bag with me and uh, I stole a load of um, groceries. And I was sitting eating biscuits, cookies on a on, on a bus stop and a police car comes up and arrests me. And then they take me back to the remand centre, take me to court. I get another three years and I go back to the same school. And again, that, that was six years. And then they send us, uh, me and Franny ran away. We, we goes on the streets. They made a mistake. They put us together. Franny got out and he got another three years. And then um, we went to a place called St. Aidan's in um, Widnes in Cheshire, where Sean Atwood's from. And um, that's where he used to do his paper round. And we went to that home. So we decided then we were getting a bit stronger. And we would attack the um, teachers. So we set this up one morning where we got all the knives, the forks, and we attacked them and we escaped. And then we get back to Liverpool. And then we, it's always on the streets of Liverpool, Matthew. And then we go to a store, we steal a load of clothes. And as we're walking through the city centre, I meet some of the most notorious guys from Scotland Road that became notorious. And uh, we do a whiskey heist on the docks because all the docks in that in them days, they had all the um, importation, you know, all the ships in Liverpool. They brought everything into Liverpool. So what we did is that we um, we just we were doing a warehouse on the docks and we would get crates of whiskey and we'd push it up to a friend's house, Joe Cavana's house. And then we'd we'd sell the whiskey and uh, escape out of there go down to, we jumped out the window and we had to swim like across a, a little lake. And Franny got caught in the middle. He had his, his glasses came off <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he couldn't see. But how, I would, I'm sorry, how old are you at this point? He was about 11, 12. Okay. Yeah. And then the other guys in the, in the gang was um, Joey Wright. He was notorious, um, became notorious. You had um, Egger London. And um, Joe Moran, they were from Scotland Road. They were the they were the most famous guys from Scotland Road. And then we get away, and then the next morning we go back to the cemetery. And then what we do is um, 
we wake up, it's cold. Our clothes are wet. We've got a blanket. And then I go to the store to steal some milk and some bread. And Franny's asleep. And the woman knows me. So they call the police and then we're caught again. They, they call the police just, just because she saw you? Yeah, because she, they knew that in the local area that we'd robbed the co-op. And oh, okay. we were so well known at the time, at this age, when we were eight, when we were 10. So they were kind of looking out for you. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then what happened was um, they got Franny, they got me, and then I was sentenced to another three years. And then Franny went back; to, he got another three years. So that was nine years, nine years in the approved schools. And I get sent to a, a school in um, Cheshire called um, Saint Joseph's. Now, in there, you had all these guys from Manchester, and I'm from Liverpool, so there's a rivalry. So they beat the hell out of me break my nose, um, beat the, just kid nearly beat the whole body to hell, you know. And I, I take it because I'm on my own. And then eventually I run away and I go back to the streets of Liverpool and I get captured again. And they gave me, um, they sent me to, in the British system in them days was called a, sh a sharp shock. Shock it was called detention. Okay. And um, I was sentenced to three months of detention, military style, and punished wow. once again. Are you are you like are, are you going to school this this whole time? Do they keep you in school? You do, yes, you, do, you yes, you do, Matthew. But also, what's happening is to the brain. We're on a high alert of um, we don't know what's happening to us because our brains are being developed. We're not getting trained. We're, it starts from when we were 10 getting abused and, and our brain is not developing because we're under what you call a state of anxiety. Right. And, it, and we're under what you call hypervigilance constant. Yeah. Yes. So it, it, it's a form. It, so it, it ends up developing into a form of uh, uh, PTSD, right? Like, I mean, you're constantly under that, that yes. brain, you know, there, there are those spikes of, of strain and then there it's okay for a little bit. And then there are these spikes and it, it just makes you extremely anxious and yeah. Grumpy and, um, but I, what I wanted to mention one thing to you. So in Florida, so the, I, don't, I don't know if people that watch these, you know, podcasts, I'm not sure if they, they realize that, you know, in the geez, you know, in the fifties, sixties, seventies, like, you know, after world war two, obviously, Europe had been decimated, right? Like that didn't yeah. happen to here. So yes. we're doing pretty good in the United States during this period of time. And still the juvenile facilities that were set up, these, these reform schools are brutal. Yes. They, they've in Florida. And I've talked about this before, uh, cause I've had some guests on that have talked about it. Uh, and I forget the name of the school. I want to say it was called white house. Um, but there's a couple of them. Where literally kids are getting in trouble. They're thrown in here for a year or so. And then two years later, their parents show up and say, Where's my son? Yeah. Like, he was supposed to be here for, you know, a year, 18 months. Where is he? And they're like, We released him. And they're like, Well, where is he? Well, we don't know. He's a bad kid. He ran away. Yeah. Come to find out 50, 60 years later, yeah. they, they end up digging up hundreds of bodies that these guys, these, guards were raping and killing these kids and beating them and then just burying them in the, you know, in the vacant fields next to the school. And now, you know, 50, 60 years later, they're now digging up these graves and it's, it's insane. So I can only imagine how, you know, it, throughout Europe, how, you know, the, the rough conditions that, you know, that the, in, God, that all, you know that all of Europe was undergoing how brutal those schools were in comparison to the United States, which really was having a huge economic boom. Yeah, that's unfortunate because what happened later on, Matthew, is it, the homes that I were in, it was the most. Um, I'll give you one incident with Saint Aidan's. It, I file a lawsuit against them. I, I, I come back from America. Um, when I'm 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 going back to get justice for myself after I went on the run, and we'll get to that later. And I went back, and um, I, I 
the police were looking for me. And there was a home called St. Joseph's, uh, St. Joseph, St. Aidan's and St. George's where I was in, where I was sentenced to 12 years and they um, were under investigation. So we, I joined a, a class action lawsuit in um, England with the courts, the European courts, and it went on for 14 years. And when I was interviewed, I was interviewed in mental hospitals in a, a place called Wampton for the criminally insane against the lawyers sent me there, their lawyers to be examined to see if we had what you call a split personality. And under them conditions, I went in and I thought I'm going to control the interview with the psychiatrists, three of them. They're not yeah. going to control me because the first question I asked the psychiatrist before you interviewed me, can you please tell me what records do you have in front of you? And I asked the doctor, um, they, these were forensic psychiatrists. I said, what year is it today? And they said, oh, it's 1997. What's the date? June the 16th. I said, do you have a, um, a report there from Los Angeles in 1981 from a hospital from Dr. Messina? And they said, yes. Do you have a report from a psychiatrist? Um, Dr. Caroline Way, yes, we do, 1983. Do you have a report there from a Dr. Obler from 1984? Yes, we do. Do you have a report there from Dr. Murray from Senior Sinai Medical Center in Beverly Hills? Yes, we do. What does that state? I made them records then, and I blame the people then for the, um, the abuse that I occurred when I was in the home and they were shocked. Now, these lawyers were the highest lawyers in Britain. They were for the courts. I was the only child out of 360 people in the class action civil lawsuit. They went against their own lawyers. They went on my side. On my side. You just mentioned PTSD. They, at the time, said I should have been hospitalized for PTSD. And I said, no, I'm okay, I'll get through this. And at the time, the diagnosis was chronic, serious PTSD. It's ran its course, but I survived it. Mm -hmm. um, going back to for your audience, Franny would die. He would die from circumstances when he was 22. Joe Moran would commit suicide. Um, Edgar London my dear friend, he would hang himself in a prison. Joey Wright would be sentenced to 21 years for importation. Eventually, he would die. So most of them passed away. Ronnie Gibbons, he did the, um, he did the Matt Brinks job in um, New York, the fifth largest heist, and um, they got $8 million. But these guys were pretty clever fellas in, in, in my gang. They were all in my gang when they were kids. Mm -hmm. And um, he went to get his money upstate in New York and he was apprehended and he was killed. He was chopped up and thrown in a lake. And last year they did a movie on him called right. Holy Heist. Apprehended, you mean? You, yeah. Apprehended makes me think of the police. Well, by what? the mafia. Okay. Yeah, the mafia. And then they chopped him up and threw him in a lake. Okay. So basically, I'm the only one alive today to tell my story. Right. And I bring their lives to the to the, the big screen. <laughs> That's what I'm doing because I'll right. never forget them. They were they were all great men. When did you eventually get out of these schools? Like, what was the next school you were in? What? Well, the next one when I ran away, Matthew, I was sentenced to um, the movie that was made on us called Scum. Right. We talked about, yeah, I, I watched part of, I, I almost watched the whole thing, but there were some brutal uh, graphic scenes, especially for a scene, uh, especially for a movie that was made back in, what was it like the, was it the sixties or seventies? Yeah. Seventies. Yeah. Well, it was banned by the British. It right. was the most violent film in the world at the time. It, it, you know, it really like, just like you had said it, it reminded me of the movie sleepers sleepers. Yeah. 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 It, very much. Um, and then I'll, Kevin, I'll 
Yeah, Kevin, Kevin Bacon. Yeah. So anyway, I went to Scum after the come out. That was the only way I could, that was what they were going to do to me. So they sent me to Scum. And obviously at the time when we got to Scum, it was like a prison. And most people were feared of Scum because what they would do, they'd either go into the Marines or the Army. And then what happened is there was all, it, actually it was Britain's toughest children that were criminals and you've got no chance of getting out. You were sentenced to two years, constant marching in the morning at six o'clock, military style, beaten up. We did get a bit of education in there, but also then there was a conflict. Who was the toughest kid? Manchester, London, Liverpool, Birmingham. So then there was what you call, who was the daddy? And then I was called out by a black child. He was the daddy. And I had what you call a straightener with him. A straightener means come upstairs. And then as we were growing up in Liverpool, me and Ronnie, you know, we used to do a lot of boxing because Ronnie was a professional fighter. And I trained with Ronnie. And um, I, he was actually number one in the world in welterweight. And um, so, you know, we know to fight. And we use what you call a Liverpool kiss, a head kiss, where you just headbutt them. And so I had a, a straightener with the daddy and I beat the hell out of him. And then I became the daddy. But then I went into solitary confinement for one month. So what I think how they did the movie, they took all the, the reports from the files and this is how they did the movie because they couldn't have done it any other way. So I'd spent about two years of my life in scum. I'd served 12 months. And then um, there were children in there at the time, breaking the, the windows. We'd come and they would slice the necks, slice the arms to pieces. And you could hear the ambulances when we were in our cells at night coming to the, the borstal, which was scum to take another dead body out. It was it was absolutely horrendous. And then what happened there later on, as I said about all the approved schools, the detention centres and scum, Margaret Thatcher and a guy called William Whitelaw, they closed them borstals down. So the British government then had blood on the hands for um, introducing that system, that it did not work. And most of them children in the detention centres, Matthew, and the approved schools today and in Borstal, most of them became dysfunctional and have passed away. Mm. Okay. How, so how old were you when you got out? I was about um, 15 and a half going on 16. So what, what happened then? I mean, did you go, like, where are your parents? Um, well, my mother had cancer. Okay. She was in hospital when I came out of scum. I hadn't seen her for a couple of years and I went to visit her and eventually she would pass away when I was 16 of um, lung cancer. So really, I didn't really know my mother. And then um, I went down south. My father was at home and he had a lot of problems with um, his heart and then he would pass away. I went to the south of England. I went to Brighton. How, I'm sorry. How old were your parents? At the time, my mother was 56 when she died, and my father was 67. I was the they, youngest. Of, right. So they had you very young. They had you yeah. older when they were older in their, in their 40s. Yeah. 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 Okay. So what I did, Matthew, I went to down to Brighton to stay with my older brother, John. I felt safe with him and comfortable. And then what happened was um, I went on the streets again. One thing, I, that's the only thing I knew was shoplifting or doing something there. So I went into a store and I stole two shirts and I got stopped by the police and I ran away. And then I went back to Liverpool and I, I just forgot about it. So that day then there was, I joined up with John, my old buddy, John Lally. And there was a thing called um, what we did then in them days. As we were getting older, we were learning as criminals. We were doing what you call what you call snatches and night safes. So John had come to me and said to me, "Listen, we've got a snatch to do. 
And it's like a big store where the woman would take the money on a Friday afternoon after all week and we'd just snatch it as she went in the bank. And then we'd, we'd run, get into a, a stolen car and we'd get away. So we did that one day and they came for me that night looking for me in the pub. So I think to myself, Matthew, I think, well, did you know, they want me for the snatch. So I have a fight with a policeman in the pub. They get me. They throw me through a big plate glass window. My arm goes through the my arm goes through the window. My arm is hanging off. My fingers are hanging off. And then the artery bursts. And then I'm I wake up in the hospital two days later. I don't know where they am. And um, they saved my life. And then the cops come in and they've got me tied to the bed with the handcuffs on. Right. And I've got the handcuffs on and the cop says to me, you're going down to Brighton. You were shoplifting. And they, and they escort me. You think, I'd, you think I was the great train robber for, right. two shirts, for two shirts. I goes down to Brighton, goes in custody goes to a prison in Ashford in London. I'm a scouser. I'm from the north. But they hate the, the north and the south don't like each other. And I get all this abuse and I'm fighting with all the Londoners. But I meet a few friends and they're okay. Then I go back to what you call the Crown Court in Brighton. And the judge said, I've got no alternative. You've done everything. You've done approved school. You've done detention. You've done Borstal. And he gave me... Um, Two years for the two shirts. And I'm at the time I'm 17 years of age. So this is I'd gone in when I was just nine, and now I'm 17. I've done nearly a total of nine years. All right. What how how did you do the whole two years? Well, I went into a London prison as a, a young prisoner. I was the youngest prisoner in the whole of the prison. And um, same thing, fighting with a few Londoners, all the London gangsters, all the young kids who were coming up. It was um, the great train robbers were in there, Gordon Goody. I met him. He became my friend. Um, I met Norman Johnson, was a dear friend who I didn't mention on Sean's. He had a contract to kill the Cray Twins in London. And Norman would become my best friend. And um, I did. I had a fight in the prison to get out of the prison. So I um, I set upon two um, black guys. I broke the chair. I locked them in the cells and I beat the hell out of them with another Scottish guy. And then I was put into um, solitary confinement once again. And then the governor said to me, you're going to end up doing life in jail. You carry on. I said, well, I need to go to Liverpool. I don't belong here. And I was shipped to Liverpool. And I finished me two and a half years. I got six months extra for beating the two black guys up. Oh, so I ended up two and I, I did two and a half years. Okay. So when you were released, what, what happened? What'd you do? Did you, you, you went straight, you, you no. went ahead, you went to college. You, you got no, it. It's no, no such thing. Well, in no. them days, Matthew, we had no chance because of my references. I was right. a born criminal. I had no chance. And so what I did, my brother, Alan, he was on the, um, he did the maiden voyage on the Queen Elizabeth II, the ocean liner. So he had a friend in Cunard and he took me to Southampton. And what he did, he got me, um, he, we falsified all the documents and I got on the ship as a cook, as a chef. And then I worked my way up to be a, a waiter. And then I worked my way up to be a butler. So then I became in charge of the um, penthouses on the QE2. And this is where I start. My life starts changing completely. And I'm going straight. But then I get these ideas because Elizabeth Taylor's on the ship with Richard Burton. And I get an idea of stealing all their diamonds. There's, right. about, there's about 14 million there. So I go to New York. And Ronnie's in New York. He's he's training with Gil Clancy, Muhammad Ali's trainer, and he's he's going to be a professional boxer. So I go to see him. I bring him on the ship, and I said, "Come on, we're going to go and steal Elizabeth Taylor's diamonds. You've got two choices. 
we can do the jewelers on the ship because I know the manager. I was dating her as a friend, not as a girlfriend. Oh, we can do Elizabeth Taylor's diamonds. And she had one of them was eight million. And um, the redemption started kicking in. I thought to myself, you know, I, I can't, I can't go and steal somebody's diamonds. She's a lovely woman. She's beautiful. And um, at the time, it was infiltrated, the QE2. On the 5th of November, it's called Guy Fawkes Night in Britain, the Irish Republican Army was at war with the British since 1969, and the conflict carried on. So then men came onto the QE2, and on the 5th of November, they're going to blow the whole of the QE2 up mm -hmm. on a, a transatlantic going across from Southampton or to New York. So when I bring Ronnie on the ship, the police are watching us, the Secret Service from London, and they arrest me and Ronnie, and they, they take Ronnie off the ship, and they said, when we get to Southampton, we want to speak to you. And I, So I guess to Southampton, I, I knew I hadn't done that wrong, and they said, um, you're a member of the Irish Republican Army. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Right. So next, next thing, um, I was, I was fired. I was sacked off the ship. They kicked me off the ship for falsifying my documents, and I'd, I'd, I'd became which, which, which you had done. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, right. And there was, you know, there was a few things we were going to do on the ship, and we were going to take all the wages that was being delivered from Cunard for the staff. We had that plan in place. Um, we would go out at night and when all the when they went to Caribbean, all the whiskey bottles and you know, we'd carry we'd go around the ship and we'd take all that and we'd store that in a, in a, in our cabins and we'd sell it. We there's lots of stuff that we did. Right. On there. But not not a member of the the IRA. Not a member of, but I knew them. All right. And later on then then there was what you there was four hundred pounds of metrics in Southampton that they found that they were going to blow it up and they all got they all got 20 years each yeah the guy fox i mean obviously they had that movie um uh was it v for victory um or for vendetta sorry v for vendetta uh but you know i i know the guy fox story which is always you know super interesting one of them the one of the ira man was released um who did the um, the Matt Springs job with Ronnie, he was an IRA man. Okay. Yeah. So what, once you were let go, what then? Now you're... I'm back to the streets. I'm back to the streets of Liverpool. And so you did the right thing, went and got a job. No. No, no. Okay. I didn't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. You know, in them days, people just work for nothing. So, you know, there was some clever guys that I knew. So early hours in the morning... I met a friend at a bus stop and I was in my car and I went, Hey man, what are you doing here? And he said, Oh, we're just watching something. And I knew him from the approved schools. Right. He was a, he was a notorious bank robber. And he said, he said to me, can I get in Teddy? I'm watching something. Now we had a headquarters in Liverpool called the gyro, which distributed. It's like security core in America that distributes all the money to the banks. Right, right. So it was like, called like the gyro. Brinks, like Brinks. Yeah, Brinks. So it was called the gyro. So what we did is um, he took me to the headquarters and I said, what's going on? He said, we're waiting for the van to come out. I'm following it. Oh, I said, okay. And because he knew me and I was, I was very trustworthy, and he asked me to come in and be the driver. So I decided the next day, I'll go myself and do my own thing. I didn't need them. <laughs> that doesn't sound very trustworthy. No, but they, <laughs> yeah, but that was okay with them. You know, I told them. Right. <laughs> because I thought, you know, I had the, um, I had the confidence that I could do just as good as what they were doing. And eventually, you know, I would team up with some of them. And um, I said, let me look at it tomorrow. So let me follow another van. 
and see how many drops he does. So he does 11 drops and the other van does nine drops. And in them, that money's getting transported to all the post offices. So the one I did was, it was, there was a quarter of a million in it in 1978. And I, I formed a notorious gang of bank robbers to hijack it. Okay. And um, unfortunately, the it it all went wrong that day. Mm, what? How, um, how did it go wrong? What? As the was supposed to get the guys on the floor, get in the back of the van, emptied probably 13, 14 bags with a quarter of a million. And one of the guys, they were too fast. They closed the door too fast. And then as the guy was going in the door to the post office, my friend punched him in the face and he flew through the window. And I write this chapter in the book. It's called Blood, Glass and Milk. He's cut. They can't get the bag off him. He won't let go. So I move in and um, I've got a hammer on me and a rifle. And um, I, I use some skills with, the, with it and I drag him in the middle of the street. But in the meantime, you've got... There's a milk float and all the customers that were waiting for the money, they run to the milk float and they get the milk and they start throwing the milk at us and all the, all the milk is smashing all over our, our bodies on our heads and that, and we get trapped. So like a, a, big, a milk floats, a milk truck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then there's a big battle in the street. <laughs> we're fighting with the, all the customers. And okay. There's blood all over the place. There's milk and there's glass. And as we're getting in the car, they're throwing bottles of, of milk, but it's glass. And they're smashing in the car and we've got blood and milk all over us. A few of us got cut. And then um, we finally, we can hear the sirens, the police, the post office alarms going off. The screamers are going off the alarm system and we get away to a safe house. And while we're in the safe house, my friend goes out to the safe house, whose house it was, and we it was the um we were in the the headline news of all the newspapers in Britain. Hammer gang. The Rob hammer, Post, hammer gang. They called, they called it the hammer gang? Yeah, the hammer gang. What, because you had the hammer? Yeah, we used to, yeah, we all used to carry hammers. And you know what our our objective, you know, was not violence. We just wanted the money, right? That's all we wanted. But you, not guns because it's yeah. Um, we could we could get difficult. access to guns, but we didn't want to use because that would save. Uh, that's twenty five years, right? Plus, it's difficult to get guns, isn't it? You can get them. Okay. Yeah, you can get them. So then, what happened is, um, I go to London, and I've been in London. And I'd done a few security vans in London with some of the London gangs. And I'd, we'd got away with that. Nobody knows to this day where they were. And um, what happened was the guy that met me that morning, they did. They were successful. They got a, away with 95,000 three weeks before. And yeah, I was just going to ask, what kind of money are you guys getting when you when you well, hit the prices? There's a, a quarter of a million, could be three quarters of a million in the van. We don't, you know, it's an estimation, right? And then about, I I I went to London, and I came back, and um, I had a, a private apartment, and I just walked out one morning, and there he was, twenty of them, and they got me. Police officers? Yeah, detectives from London and the Serious Crime Squad. How, how did they, like, how they track you down? How they, they get somebody and they rolled the guy? Yeah. Or? Yeah, one of them had, one of them had told the police where I lived and um, he got apprehended. Yeah. So I was taken into custody. Now, on that robbery, the men wore masks, so we couldn't be identified. Right. So in the police station, 
they got a woman. She wanted to be a hero. And the police showed her a photograph of me. And she went, yeah, that's him. That's him. That looks like him. Yeah. No, the police wouldn't do anything underhanded. Oh, no, no, they wouldn't. Would they? <laughs> so, so if she picks you, so she picks you out. I mean, do you go or do you try and, you know, go to trial or you just. Yeah. Take the police? You would go to trial. Yeah. So what happened is. I get charged with robbery, with force. And I get put in what you call a notorious prison in the west of England, in the northwest, called Risley Remand Centre, where we had waited to go to the approved schools. I actually was the youngest prisoner in that remand centre, and it was called Grizzly Risley, where men would hang themselves because it was so bad. And when I came in, they all were going, oh, my God, the bank robbers here. And at the time, there was only one great bank robber. was a guy called Tommy Comerford from Liverpool. And he was behind me. He was in for importation. And he came behind me and said, oh, so you're the new kid on the block? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, I was in and a guy had said to me, why don't you put an application into the, the House of Lords? to get a, um, a bail hearing, three judges in London will hear your case. So they heard my case, and um, the next morning I was released. I walked out the prison after six months. Well, I mean, you're, you're supposed to come back for trial. Yes, I did. The okay. trial was set, yeah. The trial was set in December. So the trial set in December... The only evidence they've got is the woman against me. Right. It, the evidence in England has to be collaborated. And okay. it, was, it was not collaborated. So you got one person. That's me. Right. No, I'm saying you've only, but you've only got one witness against you. Or what about, yeah. what about the informant, the guy that rolled over on you? It's what you call admissible. Okay. It, it doesn't stand. It doesn't stand. So they dropped the charges? No, what happened? The trial starts. So I have a judge. The judge came from London. I have another judge from Manchester to defend me. And I have another, what you call a queen, um, a junior barrister. And they detained me. They said it could go 50-50 each way. And I said, what do you mean 50-50? I said, I'm innocent. And they said, will you get 10 years? They said, you'll get 10 years. So anyway, as I went into the courtroom, I cut all my hair off. I put a, side, a, a razor part here. I had a suit on, and I walked in. I, I seen the witness, and the police are at the end of the corridor smoking a cigarette. And I go over to the witness, and I say to the witness, Good morning, Mr. Sino. My name's Detective Sergeant Smith from the police station. So then the trial starts. The prosecution gets up, we're going to prove this case that this man did this robbery. Next thing, they put me in the box and they get the witness and she shuffles in and my Queen's counsel says to the witness, I want you on that day, on April the 30th, you've seen the robbery and they went through it. And she said, yes. And did you identify a man? And did you see that man? And she said, yes. And then my lawyer said, well, all them men wore masks that day. So can you identify the man standing in the courtroom now? And she went, yes. And my lawyer said, well, what's her name? Okay. What's his name? And she said, that's Detective Sergeant Smith. Right. And the judge took his glasses off and went, I'll give you one more question. When you were in the police, police station, Mrs. Sino, did Detective Sergeant Smith ever show you any photographs of Mr. Mugen? And she went, oh, yes. 
So the so judge she thought, out. She thought I was Detective Sergeant Smith. Right. Next thing, the judge went, no. The judge went, Mr. Mugen, you've been found not guilty and you're free to go. Nice. The gallery went crazy. The jury went crazy. I come out the courtroom and they're all congratulating me. But then there was one big problem. What was that? They put a 24-hour surveillance on me from London and Liverpool. Okay. What's what's wrong? So when you left, what did you do? We had the next job planned. Like for like the, within the next 24 hours? No, within the next month. Okay. But they were tailing you. Yeah. So they figured so out doing, you guys were casing a joint or Yeah, it was a bank. And there was a, a large amount of money in it with two guys. And I was with, I can name one of them, Joey Wright, because he's passed away now. And um, as we're doing the bank, the police are watching us. Oh my God. And did you go, did you go in, was it like a, a burglary or at, did you go in at night? Or did you go in the middle of the day? It was like. It was in the middle of the day, Matthew, where we would use um, a, a certain technique to get a man on the floor. It was like a, a wrestle hold. And then we were tooled up to pieces, Amazon us, everything, in case anything went wrong. And it was on it was on where I was born. It was on the notorious Scotland Road. And we get him, we apprehend him, we get the box off him in two seconds. Two seconds, he's done. He's done. We go across the street in the van. Me and Joey get in the van and we're driving. And Joey says to me, we're going to the safe house. Joey said to me, Terry, there's four police cars behind us. I said, fuck it. Go to the safe house. We're done. We got surrounded about 25 police cars. They come in, they beat the hell out of us, take us into custody and charge us with armed robbery. Uh, I'm assuming you don't beat this, this one. You want to hear it? Yeah. It, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's it, it's absolutely brilliant. So I'm in the I'm in Wisley again. I'm in Wisley. Okay. And Joey gets Joey. Had had a, a private relationship with the police. He's what you call a reservoir dog, and I don't know that. All right. And he comes back to his cell and he said to me, Teddy, I've paid the police. I've paid them 10,000 to get out. When we go to the court next week, the police won't be there. They've gone on holiday to oppose the bail. So we get up to the magistrates, the biggest case, one of the biggest cases again in Liverpool. And the magistrate Wooten goes, where's the police in the case? to oppose the bail, the prosecution. Well, they're not here. Well, I want them here. Put them back in custody. We get put back in custody. Goes back up at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> no police. The law says you've got to let us go if there's no police there. Right. So anyway, the, the magistrate's going crazy. The magistrate, well, I know him. I know this Mugen guy. He's been in front of me before. He needs to stay in custody. And the prosecution said, well, the police is not here. You have to let them go. So next thing, me and Joey walk out the court. We get out. Right. Is this out on bail? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but out on bail. So Joey comes out and... He walks down the street and I come out. There's a few guys and there's a few guys from the mafia waiting for him. And I looked at him. I gave him a dirty look. And I went, no, no, no. And he looked at me. I said, I'm warning you. Be careful. And the two guys looked at me. I knew them. We had Chicago war warfare in Liverpool in, in the 70s. And they were head 
they were leading the, the Chicago warfare with guns and they were as his friends. And I just looked at them and they said, hello, Terry, how are you? And I went, I'm okay. And I knew then he was up to something. So he goes to meet the police and he signs a, a statement against me to yeah. say that. Why? That he, to say that he lent me the van in the robbery and that he wasn't there. And what? he gave me the van. So a few weeks later, the four of us, Joey, we had another bank in the city centre that no one would do. It was called Water Streets. And it was a massive, there was, there was about 186,000 1980 coming out the bank. We get the guards on the floor. We just take it. It's all set up that morning. Joey doesn't show up. He doesn't show up. So we're going to follow through with it. And as we do it, we take the box, we get the box, no problem. Right. At, at both ends of the street, we get locked in. We get trapped. Joey had informed the police that we were doing it. Yeah. So this end of the street was blocked. The other end of the street was blocked. We can't get out. So I ran and I smashed the window and I dived through a window and the other two followed me. I left. We got away. Okay. The following, the following morning at six o'clock, my door comes off the hinges. Six armed, six armed policemen come in the bedroom. I'm in bed with my wife, put a gun to my head and said, don't move. You're under arrest. Were, were you wearing a mask at the second robbery? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, so far they just have the one guy, they just have uh, Joey's, um, yeah. his statement. And he did say there was going to be a bank robbery, but they yeah. still don't, haven't seen you there. Is that it? Or no, but they wrong? know it's a, yeah. They know it's you. Oh, they know it's you. Oh, yeah. No, oh, I get no. that. Because okay. but the dying, to, you know, the dying to get me. Right. Because these are the these are the these these banks and these post offices are the biggest jobs that are going off in Liverpool, and they've got to get someone. Right. They can't let it keep happening. So yeah, I was I taken into. I was, I was just saying, and, and you and you've already beat you've already beaten a couple of ca several cases already. So yeah, you're not very popular with the police. Oh well, at the time I was the most wanted in Liverpool. At the time, I was like public en enemy number one. Right. Yet they had me down as number one at the time. There was a outside Liverpool. There's a, a gang of bank robbers from Heighton. They call the Heighton Baddies. I knew them. They were involved in. Um, a couple of them got shot on some of the, the jobs they did and um, so that, that morning they got me at gunpoint they take me in the police station 12 hours of questioning I don't say nothing the sergeant comes in he said okay you can get him up now he's getting charged with four bank robberies and I just stand there I don't say nothing then the phone goes. The sergeant said, hold, hold, hold on a second. My phone's going. He goes to the phone. He comes back and he says, you got to let him go. There's a prison strike for 24 hours. We can't take any prisoners. The government said, no prisoners. And I'm like that. Oh, my God. And the sergeant said, Mr. Mugen, make sure you come back tomorrow yeah. <laughs> at six o'clock. So I go, Matthew, I go down the street, I walk out. It's freezing. It's December the 8th. I got a shirt on. They gave me a pair of pants, a pair of shoes. I get a taxi home to my wife. I said to my wife, pack a suitcase. 
go to your mother's and get me £50,000 and meet me in London in the morning at Pan Am. Okay. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm not telling you. You meet me in London. Three o'clock in the morning, it's raining. I know the house is being watched. I just jump out the window. A car's waiting for me in a tunnel with two gangsters in it. I can mention one of them today. That was Tommy Gilday. He was one of the most fiendish men in Liverpool. He was a friend of mine. And he, he's passed away. God bless him. Tommy drove me with Egger London. And they drove me to London. I said goodbye. My wife was waiting for me. And she said, where are you going? I said, I got an idea that when I was young on the QE2, Elizabeth Taylor told me to be an actor. You should go to Hollywood. I said, no. She said, well, you could be a butler in Hollywood. So I jumped on a flight, Matthew. I got a return ticket. And I went to Los Angeles on my own. How, what year was this? 1980. 1980. So what do you do in Los Angeles? Do you become an actor? No. Um, <laughs> I get a job. Well, I, I arrive. I'm, I'm, I'm all screwed up. I'm mentally under so much pressure. It's, you know, there was a man, when they did the great train robbery in England, there was a guy on the run called, his name was Ronnie Biggs. He went to Rio Janeiro. I knew Gordon Goody, and I had this thing in my head, you know, being on the lam, on the run was horrible, and it affected me mentally. So I got a couple of jobs, and then I decided to go to Beverly Hills to become a butler. And um, I registered with one of the biggest agencies in the world. And she seen my books off the QE2 when I was the butler on the penthouses. And she said, I've got the right job for you. I've got an interview for you tomorrow. And it was with Clint Eastwood's wife, Maggie. Okay. And the job was at, in Carmel with Clint and his wife, Maggie, and taking care of the two children. Alison and Kyle. So I took the job and I went to Carmel. All right. How long did that, did that last? Well, I was there on my own, you know, it was beautiful. It was on the 17 mile drive and I was on my own and my wife was at home in Santa Monica. We had a lovely apartment and um, it was quite lonely actually. And I just felt isolated on my own. And I phoned the agency and I asked them if they had a, another job that was closer. And they said, yeah, because, you know, they're going to get commission. So um, I left. And she was, like, upset, you know. But I had a lovely life and I met Clint a few times and he had his, you know, he was going in and out the house and Kyle and Maggie. It was a lovely place to live. And then I went back to Santa Monica and I got a call to go to, um, I don't even remember this guy, Merv Griffin. Right. I know. I know, I know all the names. I know the, <laughs> you're talking about the QE2. You're not, I know all the names. Uh, what were the two twins? Uh, the two. The Cray twins. The Cray twins. Like they made a movie about them, didn't they? Yeah. Well, I always said that. I always said that me and Ronnie. You know, they were very violent men. And I always said to him, I used, they used to call me and Ronnie the Cray Twins when we were kids. He said, you're like the Cray Twins. I said, no, the Cray Twins, the Cray Twins actually, um, I write in my book, they never went through what I went through. And we always said on the street that me and Ronnie would have the two of them on the street. <laughs> yeah, a straightener. I mean, Ronnie would probably do the two of them. Right. And that's not bragging or nothing like that because they were just violent men. That's what the game was. And I don't think they'd ever gone out and done a security van. They hadn't done a post office. 
they'd never done nothing like that. They were known for the violence. That's what they were known for. Did, so, so did you? You took the job. Did you take the job with Merv Griffin? I went to um, I went to Sunset and Vine in Hollywood, and Merv asked me to fly up with him to Carmel Valley, and the money was like unbelievable. It was like double the amount that I was getting at Clint's. But this time, I could take my wife. So we went up there and I became Maeve's, Maeve's butler. But unfortunately, um, Maeve was, bi, you know, he was bisexual. Okay. And he made some remarks to me. And at the time, he had a boyfriend with him, Tony. And that was registered in the Inquirer in the, eight, in the early 80s. He sued Maeve. And I didn't like, there was some new, um, innuendos that went on, you know, and I just went, oh, oh, no, no. And I left. How long were you there? I was there about six months. Um, this is still in the eighties. So yeah. what, what, what happened at that point? You know, what did you do? What were you doing for work? Well, then I went back to the agency. I went back to the agency and she could place me anywhere being an English butler. Right. Everybody in Hollywood wanted me then. So I went back and um, I did, um, went to a place called um, the Weinberg House. They owned the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. Okay. I went there and it was crazy. <laughs> Why? Um, she was mentally ill. Um, we had a staff of seven that was absolutely nuts. It was actually, Matthew, it was Elvis's old house. Elvis Presley's old house. And okay. she was absolutely sick. So I wake up one morning and I hear this rumbling in the in the garage. So I go round and I open the the garage and all this smoke comes out. And I thought, oh, my, maybe the you know the um, the Rolls Royce is on fire, but actually, Mrs. Weinberg's in the Rolls Royce. Mm, She's okay. got a pipe going from the the exhaust into the mouth, and she's trying to commit suicide. So I get it out, call nine one one. The police come, paramedics, and um, they save her life. And she's crazy. She's abusing all of us. And um, eventually, I was at the house. All the staff left, and I just stayed there. And um, eventually, she would kill herself. She shot herself in the head. This isn't while you were there, though. Yeah. Oh, okay. How long before that took place? Well, it took place after. The, it was about a month later. She, she died. How long had you been, you know, um, working for her? Probably about four months. So Yeah. Very sad. Right. Yeah. And then Mr. Weinberg, he, he flew me over to the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. And I stayed with him for a week. And um, me and my wife. And he said, Terry, you know, I'm sorry. I said, uh, don't worry, you know, I'm I'm just used to stuff like this, being in scum, being on in all the homes, all the people who died. I was just, I was sort of used to it. I was immune to it. And um, I just got on with my life. And did then... You, uh, did you stay on with him? No. No, I got an offer to go to um, George Siegel, the actor. You're right. He was big in the in the sixties yeah. and seventies, and I went to his home in Be in Bel Air, and um, he hired me as his butler. Th this whole time, you're wanted. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah. I, okay. Are you yeah. going? Are you going by uh, by Mugen? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah it's it's amazing and um 
Well, let's go back a little bit because let's go back to Joey's trial when I left. Okay. Joey was found not guilty on the on the Scotland Road, even though he made a statement against me. He tampered with the I, I, I told him to tamper with the jury. I was in contact with a few of them, the Mafia in Liverpool. And I said, listen, when the jury comes out, follow the jury home, get on the back of the bus with them and just tell them, make sure you come in tomorrow with a not guilty. Right. And if you don't, we know where your children go to school. Right. So Joey got not guilty. So I was delighted. I phoned my lawyers in Liverpool and they said, well, if he's not guilty, you, the co-accused is not guilty. Right. So I got it. I was not guilty. Okay. So, so, but, but they're still looking for you. Yeah. But really it's just a technicality. Like they just need to get you, bring you back and yeah. go through the proceedings. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm with George Siegel at the time. Right. And um, I'm in Bel Air and I used to go to Holmby Hills and I'd make phone calls from the park. It was called Arm and Hammer Park to the lawyers. And I'd say, what do you think? They said, just Teddy, stay away. So I stayed away. And then um, um, me and George Siegel become good friends. I'm his butler running his big mansion in Bel Air. And one day he tells me, Teddy, you got to go and pick these guys up. It was Bert Reynolds, Art Carney, Buddy Aki. And then I was doing a stew for them, an Irish stew in the garden in Bel Air. And they're all smoking cigars and drinking scotch. And George says to me, oh, there's another guy going to come in about half an hour. And then there's a knock on the door. It's Robert Redford. And I went, wow. <laughs> and they're all sitting, Matthew, in there in Bel Air, smoking cigars and drinking scotch. And call them Marlon Brando, all the names under the sun. <laughs> they call him Brando, everything. He's, he's making more money than anybody. And I'm just listening to this. Right. And then is me. I'm just a butler. And George goes to... George turns to Bert Reynolds and he goes, see him? Should be an actor. And I said to George, I am an actor. I'm the butler, but you don't see it. <laughs> so I had this great relationship with him, you know. And I go out for lunch with him and it was nuts. And then he, um, I was with him about a year. And then he goes and gets his face done and he's, go, he's, he's moving back to New York. So that job came to an end. You didn't want to go back. You didn't want to go to New York with him. No, no. Yeah, I, he didn't acquire me. No. So have then you, again, have, have you been in LA this whole time? Yeah. Yeah. You okay? All right. Just yeah. wondering. Just wondering. It's nice. I mean, I know the weather is nice. You know, I know. Um, but I, I don't know why I thought at some point you were you were going to go back. You, you've been back. Yeah. Right? Okay. They'll tell you that. Okay. So, um, I go to a, a guy in Albi Hills and I do, um, he's a billionaire. He owns Toyota and he's got a billion dollars worth of artwork in his house. And he sees all my references and he goes, bump. He's just bought a $50 million mansion in Albi Hills. Barbara Streisand lives next door. Bert Reynolds lives on the other side. Frank Sinatra lives down the street. Gregory Peck, Rod Stewie, Elvis, Michael Jackson. And I'm, I'm, I'm back again in this big mansion, taking care of um, a guy called Frederick Wiseman and um, driving a Bentley, driving his Rolls Royce, flying in a, a Goldstream, a $50 million jet. And there's a billion dollars worth of art in the house. And nobody knows that they've got a bank robber in the home. Right. So how does that work out? It's brilliant. So he's away for, um, he's back in Maryland, Toyota. And um, I'm checking the house one day. 
and I open this door and there's a safe in there about five feet by three feet. And I open it and I just looked inside and in the corner, there's two bags. There was 155,000 in one bag and about a quarter of a million in jewelry in the other bag. So I decide I'm taking it. I'm back to Liverpool. You know, it's funny. I mean, even though you weren't setting up a great resume, you know, just by coincidence, you've just had a perfect resume. Yeah. You know, by that point, you'd, you'd work for all the big stars. Like, why wouldn't they say, hey, come on in? They have no idea. So it's really, per- it's really a, a perfect setup. Yeah. So then redemption started to kick in. I thought, hold on a minute. So I, I, I kept the money and I thought, shall I take 10 grand? Shall I take 20 grand? He won't know. And I'm going, ah, no, I can't do it. And my wife was the one who said to me, don't you touch that. Well, I thought you said you did take it and went to back to Liverpool. No. Oh, okay. No. Or you just thought about it? I thought about it. Yeah, okay. And that's when the redemption's kicking in. And I uh, I just got the two bags one day and I took them down to the office and I gave them to a secretary. I said, listen, he left the safe open. That 150000 could have bought me a big mansion in England. Right. But then... I'd be on. I'd, I was already on the run. I was on the lamb anyway. I'd right. be on the lamb from the United States. And I just, you know, I, I looked at the guy and I thought, you know, I've got a job. I'm doing well. And it was great. And then um, one day, you know, you had um, Andy Warhol would come over to the house. He'd buy his paintings, David Hockney, Ed Rouget. Um, he had Liechtenstein, and one day he was getting this masterpiece delivered, and he was so excited. And Teddy, when it comes, let me know. So I came in the afternoon, and here's I am. I'm immature. I don't know nothing about artwork. And the masterpiece came, and I said, "What is it?" He said, "It's the mother and child, Picasso." Okay. And I went, wow. He said, it's the only one in the world. It was the mother and child. And we hung it in the house over the living room. It was beautiful. So the next morning, I'm cleaning his office. And I seen on the table the invoice. How much? 75 million. Jeez. So what went through my mind? I'm calling my old buddy in New York, Ronnie Gibbons, to come and get it. So I'm having this battle with myself to steal the Picasso. Right. And I'm going, well, at the time, you know, when we were doing things, we didn't think it out. And now I'm getting older. You know, you're developing. You think, no, come on, you can't do that. Don't do that. So I phoned... I was going to say, and there's no market for that's right. stolen art. Yeah. And I thought to myself, well, if that's worth 75 million, how are we ever going to sell that? So then I told Ronnie, I said, no, nah, we can't do it. And uh, we never done it. And I was glad I never did it anyway. <laughs> and, I, and then um, And he left. He, um, I was with him for three years. He used to fly in a $50 million jet, um, a Gulfstream, a G4. And um, it was a hell of a job. He was the one that, um, 1969, he was blackjacked in the Polo Lounge by Frank Sinatra's bodyguards. What does that mean? Well, he was blackjacked. He was arguing in the polo lounge in Hollywood with um, Frank Sinatra, and he punched Sinatra in the face. And he gave Frank Sinatra two black eyes. So I write a chapter in the book. 
It's called All Black Eyes. And it's about the case in 1969. And Wiseman had told me all about it. And what uh, Frank Sinatra's bodyguard? Uh, yeah, he blackjacked him. Yeah. Within an hour, Matthew, the blackjack? the blackjack is, he came the back of the head. Yeah. Oh, okay. The back of the head with the phone. Within an hour, Frederick Wiseman was in Cena Sinai Medical Center getting a brain tumor off his brain. Mm. Yeah. A hell of a story. It was all the rat pack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, he leaves, he decides that he wants to go back to um, Maryland because that's where he's based, Mid-Atlantic Toyota. And he he moves. So then I'm available again then. Tells the agency, Dora, one of the greatest agencies in the world, I drove over to her and she said to me, I've got a job for you tomorrow. you got to go to Beverly Glen, meet some woman. She's the hair to uh, Max Factor. Max Factor. Yeah, the makeup blind. Yeah. Multi-billionaire. Right. She, she interviews me for her father, Max Factor, junior. Right. <laughs> Within an hour, I'm sitting in the living room in Beverly Glen in Holmby Hills with Max Factor. And he says, you're a young, delightful young man. He said, would you like to come and work for me? And he said, um, we drive every day for lunch with the nurse. We go to Malibu. I go and buy me stocks every day. And I end up with uh, Max Factor. How long does that, does that job last? Well, what happened, Matthew, was uh, my sister was coming through the immigration and she had my phone number and it was Max Factors. So I get a call from her. I was with him for about seven or eight months. Right. And then um, this phone goes and I went, hello, who is this? And she said, he said, um, it's the United States Immigration We'd like you to come down to Los Angeles Airport. <laughs> I said, what for? I said, no, I said, you got the wrong number, my friend. And I put the phone down. I had to pack my bags and I right. was gone. And then I went and got my wife and I ended up on Wilshire Boulevard in a motel. Okay. And then that was it. So then I decided, Matthew, to go home. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of it's catching up with you. Yeah, well, I was getting very sick. I'd oh, been, okay. I was, I was actually getting sick. You know, psych. I'd been to see psychologists and psychiatrists. They'd put me on a lot of medication because of the trauma that was catching up from when I was a child. Right, and um, I was working. I used to go to Muhammad Ali's gym in Santa Monica, and I trained there. With um, Jimmy Ellis, he was the, the WBA heavyweight champion of the world in 1972. He was a friend of mine. And I just had enough. I thought, I got to go back. Right. I go back. I get to Liverpool. All the technologies changed. I was a little bit apprehensive going through the airport that I could be on the wanted list. Right. And I just fly through. So I meet some of the old friends and um, I go to a, a lawyer's office about a week later and I ask him to do a, a background check on me and he said I'll put age into the Department of Prosecution it came back we went and had a cup of coffee it came back no warrants no arrests they had nothing on me. He pushes it in front of me. He said, you're free. I went, wow. So why did immigration question your sister? If, and, and call you if, was it? Because she had references on her 
that she'd worked in the United States and they knew that she was coming for the job that probably checking the system that um, I was, oh, I was illegal. I was, my visa had went out. Oh, okay. Okay. So that was the reason, Matthew. Right. But you thought it was for the, uh, uh, did you, you think it I was? I didn't for, know what. You didn't know what it was. I never knew what it was. It could have been anything. So I just bailed out. Right. I was a, I was a, I was a step ahead of them all the time. So did you, did you stay in Liverpool or where'd you? I stayed in Liverpool and then I got an offer from the mafia. The, the, the mafia in Liverpool asked me to stay. And um, things had changed then, Matthew. Importation. Liverpool is one of the biggest places for importation. Right. So they were important. Importation was millions coming in from Kenya. Um, South America, right? And I sit with them, and um, eventually I, I decline it. And they said, "Terry, you're crazy. We're making a fortune." And I just thought, "No, I can't do that because I'd seen the way my life had changed in Beverly Hills, and I wasn't that man that I was when I left Liverpool." even though I'm a safe man. And I thought, you know, I, I could go back to Santa Monica was beautiful. Hollywood, Beverly Hills was beautiful. And we could go back. So I stayed home for about eight weeks. I turned them all down. Some of them are dead. Most of them are dead today. They got life in jail. They became multi, multi-millionaires. Actually, I can name a couple of them. One is Colin Smith. Um, they were important 72 million from South America and something happened with that, that load. The Colombian sent a contractor to Liverpool and blew his head off outside the gym mm. and killed him. My other friend in speak, professional fighter Tony Sinnott, was a bully, unfortunately. A great guy, but a bully. He stepped on the toes of my friends. He also was coming out of a gym because they all go to gyms. And he was machine gunned to death. He was killed. It, was this while you were there? This was late after no, you go back. It was, to it was later. Okay. I would have connection to them and, and the men that did that. Yeah. So I did decided, no, it's not my life. Right. And I came back to America. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you, you know you can live a good life at this point. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I don't know how hard being a butler is, but it seems like a pretty good life. I mean, you're, you're well, taking... Like, actually, actually, Matthew, it's like just being like a slave, really. But you get the, you know, there's, there's good benefits to it. Right. And at the end of the day, and you've got to be consistent. You've got to know what you're doing. You've got to have the kind of, you know, the, you've got to be very charismatic, and you've got to be, you've got to have a lovely personality and be a, a yes sir, yes sir, no sir, yes I will do that, I won't do this, and it was just, it was just a personality that I had, right? Yeah, um, yeah, I have that. I'm extremely personable, a very, very polite. It wouldn't matter who you are. I'm going to be polite. Wouldn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't really matter what you say to me. I'm going to be pretty, but pretty, pretty polite, no matter what. You know, it's I, I have a very even temper. That's the best way to go. Yeah, it's the only way. Yeah, I might cut your throat later, but yeah. at the time, I'm going to be like, absolutely, oh, yeah. you're right. That's my fault. I apologize. Let me take care of that. Let me yeah. do this. So yeah, um. So you so you go back to you go back to is it LA? Yeah, I went back to Dora. Okay, and, and she tells me, yeah, she tells me I've got this job in Orange County. All it's right. for an, it's for an attorney. His name is Teddy Giles. I don't know that name. He did, he worked on the Hillside Strangler, the Freeway Killer. The okay. Fred Bar Douglas murders. 
And I go to this estate in Orange County on five acres of land. There's a 5,000 square foot house for me and my wife to live in, 11,000 square foot house for where he lives. He has a cinema, um, five acres outside with peacocks, swans, and flamingos, waterfalls, a million dollar tennis court. And he hires me as his butler. So it, it's a tough gig. <laughs> I, I didn't think that, to me, yeah, it was hard. So I told him, I, I said, I'm not sure whether I'm going to take the job because tomorrow I've got an interview in Malibu with Johnny Carson. Right. And he goes, no, Teddy, I, you know, I feel comfortable with you. You know, you young man, you're lovely. He said, I'll give you a sports car. He said, I own a Toyota dealership in Garden Grove, Garden Grove Toyota. He said, I'll give you extra money. Anyway, we took that job, me and my wife. And I was living in Orange County in a 5,000, well, a, a $2.5 million home with my own swimming pool. And I was taking care of a $15 million estate. And who would come? None other than Oprah Winfrey. He was their lawyer. Um, are you legal in the United States at this point? I got a new visa. Oh, okay. When I left England. I, when I was in England and Liverpool, I renewed my visa. So, actually, I'm glad you said that because Ronald Reagan, who I'd met at Wiseman's house, um, he used to bring his daughter there, Maureen, for tennis lessons. And I'd met him a few times. It, and this is when he was governor of California, right? Yeah. Okay. No, we, no, we think he, no, he was president. Oh, okay. He was president then. I think he was president. I, well, I didn't take too much notice. But he had um, an amnesty. Okay. He, it was the only amnesty in um, American history. So my wife went out. She went to the immigration in Santa Ana and got us the applications for green cards. Okay. And that's how I got my green card nice. was through the amnesty. Okay. And then I, I was, I was legal. So I stayed with Teddy Giles. I took care of a guy um, called Bill Millard, the fifth richest man in the world in the eighties. He owned computer land. I took care of him. And, um, he was an interesting guy. Yeah. He was, um, Giles was defending him on a lawsuit. I think it was 360 million at the Alameda courthouse in San Francisco. Okay. For what? Uh, what was the lawsuit? Do you remember? It was the lawsuit was um, where the they were fighting over the you know the agreement in the contract. Okay. And Giles won it, and then Bill, Bill Millard went missing. He went to the Cayman Islands, and he was found twenty five years later. He owed the taxes hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So and he. he Okay, I thought you meant like he died. You mean he no, just disappeared? Just disappeared, and he and he went there for like twenty five years, and then they mm -hmm. found him. Yeah, very interesting guy. And Oprah would come with Stedman, you know, and that was a very interesting job. I used to just have five acres of land to myself, like a living like a billionaire. Yeah, yeah. How long and how long did that go on? Well, I was happy because my wife got pregnant, and then Mr. Giles and Mrs. Giles got very unhappy. They didn't want a child on the property. Okay. And, and they wanted someone that didn't have any children because maybe the child would have been a liability on the property, being a lawyer. Right. So I was happy. I was having a baby, you know, my life was changing. So um, we left. We left. 
and I bought a little house in Santa Ana. What what year was this, by the way? That was in eighty nine ninety. Okay. And we left. And yeah. um, I write a brilliant chapter on Teddy Giles. Yeah. In how the long? Book. Sorry, how long? Um, so how old were you at this point? Now I'm about... you to be in your 40s, right? No, just no, 30, 34, 35, something like that. Okay. So I just settle down and I go to Dora and I make a call, phone call to her. And she's got me a job with the bishop in Orange County. I don't know who that is. The bishop in Orange County at the time was McFarland. Okay. This is for the Catholic Church? Yeah. So ironic. I was abused by them. And here I am now. I'm going to a school called uh, Martyr Day High School. All the priests that live at a house. And I'm going to be taking care of them. Right. So the bishop interviews me and he hires me. And I'm cooking for them every night. So one Monday morning I get there and there's commotion upstairs and a nurse comes down. And I sort of looked at her, I thought, who are you? Oh, she said, we've got a patient upstairs. And it was one of the priests. She said, come up and meet him. You know, you, you can, you'll be doing the, in the cooking for him. And he's laying in the bed, he's gaunt, he's on IVs. And I put two and two together in my head. I thought, something wrong with this guy here. Well, the AIDS e epidemic had came in, hadn't he? Right. And I put it together, and I was right. And the bishop was hiding the priest in the bedroom. He had AIDS. Okay. And also, his name was Jack Lord, and he was a child abuser. And he... They'd done a settlement in Orange County on him for 3.5 million and paid the parents off. He was a child molester. Right. That sound that name sounds familiar. Yeah, Jack Lord. And then at the time, it was going all over Orange County. At the time. Schools were getting investigated. And then um, there was priests in L.A. and Boston all getting investigated. So there was a massive investigation in Orange County against all, um, like, one school was Father Harris in St. Um, Margarita's High School. And a few of them were interviewed. Anyway, the Catholic Church, put it into a nutshell, who defends them? Who's the lawyer for the, the children? Okay. None other than Teddy Giles. He's the lawyer. He defends right. the children. And they do the largest settlement in American history for 100 million. So they, but I'm sure then they, so they bury all those cases, right? I'm sure there's a. Yeah. So I write in the book about the Bishop McFarland, about the Catholic Church. I tell the story. How long do you work with, uh, for them? It was quite a few months, very few months and. You could just sell. You just see by looking at them when they were having the dinner, the behaviour out of them. Very sick people. And here I am, myself saving them. And what I'd gone through, I'd had the biggest lawsuit in British history. And then I'm working for these, and then there was the, the biggest lawsuit here in American history. And then who do I work for? 
it was Teddy Giles. Right. It's so a lot of coincidences. It's, yeah, it's crazy. Absolutely bananas. Who? How, where do you end up after that? I was in when I was in prison, waiting for trial. There was a three million dollar heist on the docks of travelers checks. And I had them in my, I, I bought 5,000, I, I, I gave 5,000 and I bought 25,000 and I brought them to the United States with me when I went back home. They were in my mother-in-law's home. Okay. So I decided to go to San Francisco and cash them in. Are they are these like non traceable or? Well, you know they were stolen. American Express. Now I, I used the British license. I thought I'll make myself a quick twenty five thousand. Did you? Yeah, I went to San Francisco. I cashed twenty thousand in in a week, and then I had five thousand left. So I got this idea one morning to go to Disneyland. Okay. With a friend. And I went to Disneyland. And I was on Main Street. And one woman didn't like the way I'd signed the check. So she called the police. And I got arrested on Main Street in Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> but I, okay, so the checks were stolen. Yeah. Do they know they're stolen? Yeah, they ran a check on it. Okay. Yeah. So they ran the check and eventually, yeah, they're stolen from England. So I'm thinking, hey, hang on a minute. Are they going to come after me for the $3 million heist off the docks? Right. And I'm in custody. And, you know, as you know, Matthew, each check you write is a felony. Each one is a felony. So I get I get done with four felonies. And I hire one of the greatest lawyers in Orange County. His name is John Barnett. He did the um he, he um, defended the cops in the Rodney King case. Okay. And he comes back to me and he says, um, Teddy, they want you to go to jail for four and a half years. I found those checks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was still, even if, yeah, if I found them, yeah. I was guilty <laughs> with the felony. Even if I found them and I never signed them, then I found them because then I didn't do, I didn't commit a crime. Right. So, you know, I, I couldn't, Matthew, I couldn't get out of it. Couldn't get out of it. So Did John gets me uh John gets me um, a deal. I get 18 months. In a California prison? Yeah, Orange County Jail. Oh, okay. I'm going to say, that sucks. Yeah, it was brutal. Yeah. So I go into jail. Two guys are trying to pick on me. And they said, um, are you Irish? I went, yeah, I'm the Irish Mafia. I said, when we get upstairs, I'm going to fucking kill the two of you. I'm going to knock the both of you out. And they went, wow. So they separate me and put me in the tank on my own. <laughs> so I did a few months in there, and then I went to an open prison. And what is that? What's um, an, open an open prison. It's like a farm. Okay. Yeah. It's called James Music in Orange County. Yeah, they were in the federal system. They'd call that a camp. Yeah, a glimpse of camp. Yeah. We're going to the camp. Matthew made a big mistake the next morning. I'm on top of the bunk. And I get down and put my boots on. And the guy downstairs said to me, hey, mother such and such, get your effing boots off me bed. And I went, oh, my God. So this Mexican guy comes over to me, said, he's, he's, he's the boss of the jail. I said, is he? I said, we'll soon see. 
So the next morning, Matty, they used to get us up with um, Vietnam music at 5 a.m. Ding, 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 ding. You get this Vietnam music going off. It's crazy. So we're going to the recess. And um, on the commissary, I bought some cigarettes. So I said to the guy, you want a cigarette? And as I gave him the cigarette, I had a towel wrapped around my hand. And I just went bang and knocked him out. And he fell like a like a tree. I got these two black guys. The black guys went, wow. They said, pick him up and throw him on the bed. I said, go and tell that guy he fell over and banged his head. And I got away with it. Right. And then everything was peaceful in the, in, in the camp. He was just a big bully. So I, I, I did my time. And as I was coming out, um, they said to me, um, are you a citizen? And I just said, yeah. I said, yeah, I'm a citizen. Anyway, that was it. I went home. I had the house in Orange County. And within about, uh, I'd say about six weeks, early hours in the morning, four guys knocking on the door, the FBI. Why? Bang, bang, bang. Mr. Mugen. Yeah. We're federal agents. You're under the rest. So what for? We're taking you to court this afternoon for deportation. You're a felon. Oh, so you're you're it it invalidated your um uh your green card. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd committed. Um, I was a felon. Right. Four felonies. So they put me in deportation. Goes to see the judge. He said, what do you do? I said, I've got, a, um, I said, I've got my own business. I, had a, um, I formed a window cleaning business, maintenance, cleaning chandeliers. And um, I get put into deportation. And um, I get a lawyer by the name of John Alcorn. He's a judge's advocate. And I fight the case. But at the time, Matthew, I'm doing public speaking for International Toastmasters. And I've become the president of International Toastmasters. And I'm teaching all the immigrants English. So I told John, I said, well, John, let me defend myself in the courtroom. So we have a big trial in Los Angeles on Olive Street. And the prosecution gets up and he says, um, Your Honor, he needs to be deported. And then John said to me, Go on, Terry, defend yourself. I got up, said, um, Your Honor, the scales of justice at half an inch off that even. I said, let me tell this man, this prosecution, my life. And I told him my life story. And I said, I, I took care of a dying priest that was dying of AIDS. I worked with the Catholic Church as an orderly. And I have the references, Your Honor, to show you. I said, my wife's a United States citizen. My daughter's a United States citizen. I don't deserve to be deported. The question he asked me, Matthew, was, well, what books do you read? And I said, I've read many books in my life. And I said to him, well, what books do you read? I said, what do you think is the best book to read? And I said to him, you've asked me a question. I said, there's only one book, the Bible. <laughs> book in the world. That's the book I read. And the judge just went, no more questions from you. And he gave me a stay in America. And I got my green card back the next day. Nice. When was that? God, that was in full. I'd say in the 90s, 95, 96. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, how old are you at this point? I'm 40 odd. 
Yeah. Did you go back to uh, work as a as a butler? Well, I actually um, I went as bodyguard for who? Well, we had this we had a window maintenance in Orange County, and we'd had a bankruptcy in the nineties. Now the county tax treasurer was Bob Citron had gambled 480 million on the stock market and lost it. Uh, of the county's uh, money. I was going to say of the county's money. That's, yeah. It's not good. Yeah. So can you imagine what happened to Orange County? How affluent it was all the rich. Orange County went into bankruptcy. Hmm. Now I was friend with Bob and I felt sorry for him. So one day I was in his house with his wife, Teddy. And I said to him, you know, you need some protection. You know, you're going outside the front house all the time. The news is after you. Do you want me to help you? I mean, what, what, you know, these people have got no common sense. Very, very highly educated, but common sense on the street like we've got. They don't have it. So I went to the back neighbor across the street and I said, excuse me, can we use your house to go out the back door? And they said, yeah, they said, there's too much news on Shannon Lane and Santa Ana. And then Bob said to me, will you be my bodyguard? And I went, yeah. So I took him to court. Oh, okay. every week. And um, I drove him in my car. Nobody knew. And he thanked me so much. And he actually, he didn't ever get any gain for, for the 480 million. It was an error that he'd made a bad judgment. Right. He never stole anything, Matthew. And the judge gave him 12 months in a food bank. Still, that's lucky. He got lucky. He got lucky, yeah. But he, he never made any gain for his own life right. but at the time then in the 90s the whole of orange county had gone bankrupt it was absolutely bananas right so how long did you work as a bodyguard for for was this oh, about, about oh. six six months yeah yeah it was interesting did you ever go back to being a butler? Yeah. I started um, in Newport Beach on the coast in California. I started what you call a, a, butler's, di a butler's dinner menu. So I'd go to certain homes on the weekends and I'd do dinners for private people. Right. The likes of a guy down in Newport Beach called Jim Slemons. He owned a Mercedes dealership. I'd go to his house in his multi-million dollar home and I'd, I'd be the butler for the weekend. And while I was there, um, I met a man on the moon. <laughs> Who's that? Neil Armstrong? No, Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> <laughs> so Buzz Aldrin comes with his wife and um, Buzz says to me, what a lovely meal. Because it was all gourmet, you know. And he said, Teddy, um, can I have your number? I went, yeah. And I ended up going to Buzz Aldrin's house in Emerald Bay in Laguna Beach. And he's shown me all the stuff in his house. And I write in the book, The Man on the Moon. Right. And um, I was just talking to him. And I said, what was that Apollo 10 or 9 you went in? I said, I flew in a G4. I said, have you ever flown in a G5? He went, yeah, I've been in a G5. And I was just laughing with him, and he was dead nice. And then I just, my life just settled down. You know, my daughter was going to a private school, and I moved out of Santa Ana, and I moved to a place called Irvine. Yeah. It was uh, crazy. And then I get calls from um, 
Oh, I've got a call to go to see Marlon Brando. And I thought to myself, I got to go and see him. I'd read so much about him and I loved the way he acts in the movies. So we lived on Mulholland Drive. And Dora said to me, you got to take this job. you got to take it. I said, well, let me just go. So I drove to Mulholland Drive and I, I, I knew Jack Nicholson lived down the, uh, the other end of the street. <laughs> I'd heard that. So I goes to Marlon Brando's house and he had a maid and she let me in. And I went in the house on Mulholland Drive and I sat with him. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, Matthew, I didn't want to work for him. Why is that? It just, you know, his, his lifestyle, his behavior, I just, I couldn't do it because of the way he led his life. But my objective was to just sit with him. Right. And watch him. And I wanted to say things too much at the time, but I couldn't. I said, listen, I felt like saying, listen, Marlon, we're the real deal on the streets of Liverpool. You may be the godfather. That's what I felt like saying to him. But I was the godfather of my gang. And you couldn't do what we did. It would be absolutely impossible. I felt like saying that to him. But the objective to meet a lovely man like that, that had been in the movies, was like very honorable. And I left. And he said, well, when are you, do you think you're going to come and work for me? I went, well, let me talk to the agency. The agency the next day, Dora, said to me, Teddy, he wants to meet you again. And I said, no, I don't want to work for him. It's, it was brilliant because I loved Marlon Brando. Right. He's in one of my favorite movies uh, called The Score. Oh, yeah, The Score. Yeah, but that was with him, with the, yeah, with, and he's in the bathtub. Yeah, yeah. He's in the yeah, bathtub. It's, yeah, with, it's with, um, Ed oh, Norton. Ed Norton and, yeah. um, De, uh, De Niro, Robert De Niro. Yeah, De Niro's like, got yeah, De Niro's got his own little restaurant. Yeah, he's this. It's that's a that's one of my favorite movies. It's a great movie. Is it? You like yeah. that? And then De Niro's he's he's got the little the restaurant. He's counting the tables at night, and and he and him he's dating the black woman. Yeah, yeah, he uh, yeah. At the very end, um, like I didn't see it coming. I really thought Edward Norton got him. You know, his character, I really thought, oh, he just screwed him over. He screwed it. And then when he pulls out, when he, he's actually switched the, yeah. the saber. <laughs> and and he like, walks out. Man, that was great. Yeah. Oh. But I'd, I'd, I'd been to a lot of movies, Stars Holmes. Um, I went to Spielberg. I went to Stephen in, um, in Warner Brothers. And um, I thought, I didn't think nothing of it at the time, you know, Matthew. I was just right. a guy doing my job, but it's so ironic today when I, I tell my stories and the book that I wrote. Did you know the book went to number one? No, I was going to ask you, when did you start that? Was it like once you kind of retired or did you, were you taking notes? Like just kind of no. during, no, just, you just decided one day I'm going to start writing it. No. Well, let me go back to Spielberg. Okay. For your audience, if they're watching. I went back to Spielberg because he asked me to come and work for him, but he had these parrots in the kitchen and he said, you've got to change the, the, the parrot cage every day. And he was married to an actress called Amy Irving at the time. And it was his behavior that he just didn't, I just found it inappropriate that I just couldn't work for him. Nothing I, anything specific? No. Okay. Uh, no, I probably could have done, you know, but it was just the way I, I didn't want to be clean and padded poop up because right. I'm a butler. I'd, I, you know, I'd lost a lot of jobs because of the behavior out of some of the stars. Like Mickey Rooney. He lived in Westlake Village in um, Ventura. He was just, you know, you couldn't work for them. 
because yeah. of behavior. I went, I'll tell you where I did go. I went to um, a guy called Richard Donner. He did all the Lethal Weapon movies. Okay. And my friend was his butler. And unfortunately, um, he killed himself in Richard Donner's home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he took one of um, Richard Donner's guns in his house and he, he killed himself. Very sad. And then I got a call to go to um, Joan Rivers okay. um, to take care of Sir Lawrence Olivia. And that was an honour to take care of him. And he was a lovely man, very quiet. And then um, Joan was married to a guy called Edgar Rosenberg. He committed suicide. And jo- yeah. Yeah. And Joan Rivers asked me to come permanently to her, but she had all these bodyguards and dogs. I didn't want to be in that environment. So I never went. And then I get other offers to go and work for certain people. And I just, I was worn out with it. And then um, I was going back to Beverly Hills one day and I was on the freeway. I seen this car coming in and off the freeway. And um, eventually he rear-ends me. And um, he's a big kid. And I told him, listen, you're under the influence. Park your car over here. And I said, I'm going to the hospital. And I got his documents. And it was Tom Hanks' son. <laughs> okay. Um, Chet Hanks. So a year later, unfortunately, you know, I felt sorry for Tom in a way. We filed a lawsuit. And then the lawsuit went all over the world. And then I was on TMZ. They were calling me everything for being a fool, for letting him go. I didn't think that he should have been arrested because I think if somebody's under the influence, it's um, an addiction. It's not a crime. It's more of a mental problem. So I got slaughtered by the news. Right. And um, we eventually... um, I had settled. someone write, yeah. Yeah, you settled the lawsuit? Yeah, we settled it in in San Diego. And just to get it over with was horrible. I could have kept it going. And I didn't, I didn't really want to keep it going. Right. So then my daughter, I raised it in Orange County with my wife. And... Um, I was out with her one night and she stood by me and she said, um, dad, why don't you write a book? And I said, no, I never thought about it. So the pandemic was coming around. So yeah. Just- you had some time on your hands. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did is she ordered me all these big books to write in. So I just sat there one day. Matthew, and I just went, in 1963, 15 men were going to hijack a train and steal the Queen's money. So I write about the great train robbery, and then I just go, there was only 15 in that gang, but in my gang, there was only five. I was eight years of age. Right. And that's how I start writing. So it took me three years to write it. Did you, and you got a, a publisher? Did you get, have to get a literary agent? I mean, did you? No, I did it all myself. I had a guy help me. He typed it. Right. But I wrote the whole thing. Right. No, I meant like when you got it published, how did, did you go to a publisher? Well, somebody had um, got in touch with Sean Atwood in England. Um, he has a crime podcast. Right. And somebody had said to him, 
um, there's a guy in California that you've got to interview. Okay. I need to interview Sean, Sean Atwood. I, I yeah. keep, listen, I think about this once every couple of months. I think I've been on his show twice. Why haven't I interviewed him? It's not that he's, I've never even asked. I'm assuming he would be interviewed. I don't know why I, ha I haven't, but well, who, the guy in California, you just said, I need to interview. So, um, Sean calls me. Right. And he goes, hello. And I go, who this? He went, Teddy, it's Sean Atwood in England. I said, what do you want? I was joking with him. <laughs> you know, he said, Teddy, you've got to come to London. I said, let me think about it. So I thought about it for the month. He calls me again. I said, I think I'll go. So I went to London. You, and how long you were interviewed by him, right? Several times. Actually, I did three podcasts with him. And I think it was the, the second biggest podcast that he's ever done in Britain. It became got a big, really big hit. And it was all about my life. And um, I think YouTube did slow us down. Got a massive audience, and it was up there a lot, right? And um, so at the time, Sean told me he had a publishing company, and he yeah. said, and um, he never asked me. So when I come back to the United States, I asked him. I said, "Do you think you'd want to publish the book?" And he went, "Yeah." So he said, um, send me all the information, and then we got it going. And then um, we designed the cover. I wrote everything. I corrected everything backwards and forwards for six months, and it was published in December. And it went to number one in three categories, in, in um, best in crime, bestseller in crime, it went to, um, I was number one, and El Chapo was number two. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. How did it do in in, uh, in the UK? I think it's doing great. Yeah, because the UK yeah. is big on true crime. They love true crime. Yeah, they love it. And um, Sean left me a message the other day. He said, yeah, your book's doing brilliant. So basically... I'm glad I did it now, but it was all because of my daughter. Right. But the whole objective is um, is redemption. So the book is like, you know, the Liverpool um, bank robber to the Hollywood butler, and I can show it to your audience when we conclude. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a link in the description too, and I'll, I'll, you know, explain that we can put the link to the book in the description box for the video. Yeah, it's um, it's done very well, but I think it would inspire people. I've got lovely messages from all over the world on YouTube. The basically is uh, it's redemption, right? To help people, Matthew, and I believe it's just gone into the prisons. In one of the prisons, I got a, a, a mail yesterday. They put it in a, a um, one of a, a notorious library prison. In um, Manchester, strange ways. They're putting it in there. So it's been quite a journey of life. I write 45 chapters of the book. What are you do and what are you doing now? Just well, I was thinking of writing the second book. And I just live like in Laguna Beach now. And I, I worked on this hell of a, a project. And going back to England, I've been invited to do some interviews. And there's a guy in London and um, works with a lot of all the filmmakers. Um, Stephen Gillahan, he's an IRA man. He was an IRA man. Right. I don't really ever heard of him. Stephen Gillahan. He wanted me to come to London and 
with, and work with them and get some projects going. So I've just, at the moment, I'm working in Laguna Beach with a, 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 um, a beautiful family, Mike Thomas and his son, Keegan, and we're, we're putting um, episodes together for the movie, section so, one. So you saw, did you sell the life rights? No. Okay. We're just in the in the process at the moment putting section one, section two, section three, and section four together for the um, it's a, a Bible, right? The um, you know the Bible, um, yeah, for movie rights, yeah. And yeah. I think it would be, it would be, I think it would make a great movie. Who pitches that for you? Are you gonna? Do you have an agent that's gonna pitch it? No, we're probably down the line. We you know we'll 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 form something. And, and um, create it. But some of the feedback that I got from the um, reviews on Amazon was like out of this world. And the title, people, Sean asked me, he said, how did you get the title? I said, well, the Liverpool bank robber to the Hollywood butler is beautiful. Right. From the little, yeah. chi little child. Yeah, um, nice. Plus, and, it's nice and simple. It, it sums it up very quickly. Yeah, and you know, I speak for the um, most of the guys that have passed away, like Joey. He went on importation. He became a multimillionaire, and um, everyone was afraid to say things about him in Liverpool. But I wasn't because I knew that I. I'd sort them out, you know, and I did sort them out when I go home. There was two guys. Um, they got shotguns and they wanted to go and kill them. And I said, no, don't do that. Yeah, Teddy, we're going to kill them. I said, no, you're not going to kill anybody. I said, let's go and tax them. And we taxed them. And we got 150,000 out of them. And he was feared. I feed, I put the feed of life in him for what he'd done. A few months later, his son was killed. He was shot in the head. And then Joey got 21 years in Scotland in jail. Come out of jail. And he asphyxiated on his own sick and he died. And um, most of them... They're all dead. Right. They all died, Matthew. It's very sad. Well, how do you feel about this interview? Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's great. Uh, well, I'm going to, do you have anything else to say before I wrap it up? Yeah, I'd like to say to the people in America, um, Give them a nice, if you're ever watching this interview and you want to get into gangsterism or you want to commit crimes and you're watching, no. The best thing you can do is get an education. And I'll give you an example of that. I was talking to a guy a few months ago and he said to me, Teddy, I should have made millions. I lost it. I said, no, you never went to jail. So here's what I said to him, Matthew. When you wake up in the morning and you're not in a cell, you're a millionaire. Right. When you walk down the street where you live on the beach, you're a millionaire. When you don't have a prison officer locking you up at night, you're a millionaire. And then when you wake up the next morning, you're a millionaire. So you are a millionaire, my friend, and you've never done any prison. So you're a millionaire. Yeah, it's a it's a good life out here. You don't really. Yeah. It's, too, it's too bad, you know. Like for me, I had to go to prison to really realize how good it is out here. Oh yeah, people don't realize they want this, they want that. I've seen it all. Yeah. I've seen it all in Beverly Hills. I've seen everything. When you wake up in the morning, people want to do things and. You know, people um, say to me, oh, yeah, I would have loved to rob the bank and 
nah. If I had my way, I would just would have. So getting back to your audience and telling them, go and get a good education and think about your life and better yourself and get some good education behind you, get a family, because that's better than all any, any kind of gangsterism in the world. I've been with all of them in London. They're all, they've all passed away. They've all got killed. So life is very precious. Don't take it for granted. That's my message to your audience. Hey, thank you guys so much for watching the interview. If you liked it, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Share the video so that you're to your friends and family so that they can enjoy it. Also, I'm going to leave in the description box, we're going to leave the, uh, the link to Terry's book. I really appreciate you guys watching. Check out the book. Thank you for checking out the interview. See ya.